I don't see a recording. Maybe it's, it's recording. recording. Okay. It's, it's what a great recording. way to start. <laughs> um, yeah, usually it will like notify me, but I don't see anything. Anyway, um, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to the first ever 15 and 15. As you know, we'll be here Monday through Thursday every day in September with 15 tricks, hacks, cool ideas for teaching. So today um, we are talking about open pedagogy. And this will just be a very brief introduction to what open pedagogy is and a couple of ideas to get you cooking. Um, and we're gonna start by talking about access. Um, this is a, an interesting word in the open community because sometimes people actually say that access is not the right word because access is not enough when we're thinking about pedagogy. Um, it's not enough to make something available. It's really a question of how you engage with it. But I like the word access if you think of it in two separate ways, um, access to knowledge and also access to knowledge creation. So before I dive into those, I want to do a quick little um, activity. If you can take a second and just, um, go to slido.com and type in that little code. You could probably use the QR code too, but that would seem a little tricky. Um, and just type in any words that come to mind when you think of access. Um, any words at all, totally fine. I will not do this because if I get off this screen, Lord knows what horrible things will happen to my PowerPoint. Um, but any word, so people thinking about access to what? To information, access to justice, um, equity as being aligned with access, um, digital access, access as an entry point. Um, so you can keep populating this, but what I wanted to do by having this little exercise is to say that when we're talking about access in open pedagogy, we are talking about like all the nuances of that word that you can think of. So if we kept doing this for 10 more minutes, everything that you threw up there would be part of the access that I'm talking about. I'm not just talking about a very simple idea of access, like, you know, here's a thing you couldn't get before and now you can get it. We're talking as broadly as we can about everything related um, to access. So in open, um, I tend to think about access to knowledge and access to knowledge creation. So access to knowledge is kind of the, the easier part of that. Um, and it goes to what somebody put in there when they said access to information, right? This is the kind of access we're very familiar with. Um, one of the ways we think about it in open education is access to your textbooks. And lots of students can't afford high cost commercial textbooks. So one of the basic principles in open pedagogy is that we try to lower the cost of the actual physical artifacts of knowledge, i.e. your books, by making them um, free or even in some cases um, just thinking about the price and trying to bring it down. Um, but there's other ways of thinking about access to knowledge. So for example, if can you um, access this very cheap or free digital textbook if you don't have a laptop or a phone with data? So we might think of that as digital access. Um, we might think about basic needs as access to academics. So for example, if you can't afford the bus fare to get to college, if you can't afford childcare for your child, if you can't afford to eat breakfast, are you going to be eight or lunch? Or are you going to be able to make it to, to a 4 p.m. class when you're that hungry? Um, so sometimes we can think about just the basic needs that people need to help them access information and knowledge. Um, colonialism is a is feels like a different level, but another way to think about this is um, what if only the richest, whitest, and most privileged people had the time to create materials. And then we were so kind that we made these available to everyone. Now everybody has access to that knowledge, but that knowledge could be seen as a kind of colonial, uh, colonialism um, because other people are not um, involved in the creation of that content. So being critically aware of what it means to give somebody access, right? To be generous and give access can also be a form of colonialism. And then finally, supporting sustainable public approaches to education. It might be great if you have something that you can afford and you buy it and you give access to your students, 
but is that going to be sustainable over time? What's the architecture that allows for people to keep having access? So all of that is part of access to knowledge. And then over the other part here is where we get some of the fun stuff that's really related to pedagogy, which is access to knowledge creation. First of all, valuing the academic work that students do so that if they're doing it in your Canvas shell, you don't just delete it all at the end of the semester and start fresh again. The idea is the work they're doing can be real, it can have impact, and it can be meaningful both to them, but for the field. Um, seeing all knowledge as contestable, improvable, and collaborative. This is kind of an open way of thinking about knowledge. Instead of an encyclopedia that is the first and last word on, on knowledge, the idea in open is that all knowledge is waiting to be improved. It's waiting for new perspectives. It's waiting to be augmented. Um, so we think of that when we're introducing our students to our fields, that it's not making them expert in the field as much as it is welcoming them into a community that is constantly improving knowledge or what we might call the knowledge commons of your field. Um, amplifying the po uh, positive public impact of the university. The idea here is that um, if we wanna make knowledge more accessible, um, universities can be engines that help to do that rather than um, walled gardens that sort of hold uh, or elite um, institutions like ivory towers that keep their stuff to themselves and sell it to the people who can afford it. Instead, the idea is um, how can you think of your course, your program, your faculty as part of um, an ecosystem that welcomes people into knowledge participation. And then finally, um, thinking about technologies. We have all seen the ways that technologies can help us put knowledge out into the world, right? You might be working on a project in a um, climate studies class and you publish your data and you make it open and that's wonderful. But we've also seen how um, sometimes technologies can spread misinformation. Um, those are not black, black and white categories. So part of thinking about knowledge creation and the knowledge commons is thinking about how technology um, can help, can hurt, is involved in all of the work that we do when we're trying to share information. So those are kind of the baseline principles of um, open pedagogy, increasing access to knowledge and increasing access to knowledge creation. Um, but what does this actually mean that we would do in a classroom? So some of this is really uh, obvious. For example, switching from high cost commercial textbooks to OER to save students money, right? That's a very basic way you can make a course textbook more accessible. Um, but the open educational resources are not just free, they're openly licensed. And that is part of not just um, providing access to knowledge, but access to knowledge creation, right? That's really about the idea that we expect the work in that textbook could be improved by scholars, by our professors, even by our students who are engaging with it. Whether you improve the textbooks that you're working with is not as important as the attitude that you have when you realize that this textbook could be improved. So it's really about welcoming your students into an ecosystem where you say, look, knowledge is always changing. Um, there's always new perspectives and we wanna welcome you into that community. So students can get involved in uh, curating, creating, revising, uh, openly licensed materials. Um, and you can think not just about your own students, but about students all over the world, learners all over the world, who could potentially be involved in the kinds of projects that you're doing, either just by reading them or by ultimately taking them in a new direction. Um, we like to think about expanding access in open one step at a time. So the idea is not I'm gonna get an open textbook. My students are gonna revise the entire thing. I'm gonna put it all on an, on an open website. Every single thing is gonna be accessible to all learners, whether you're blind, whether you're deaf, whether you have um, a, a color blindness, or you have a mobility impairment. There's only so much access that you can make happen at one time. And also every time you make something accessible to one group of learners, you're potentially closing access to other groups of learners. So the idea is not to make everything accessible and open all the time. The idea is to all the time 
have openness and accessibility in your mind um, so that you're asking questions about how could I expand the impact of this work. Um, another thing is that you can become as an academic a basic needs champion. We have basic needs champions on this campus who it's their job to do that. Um, they might run the food pantry or work in financial aid and they're constantly looking at ways uh, to help our students afford the basic things they need to survive. Um, we can do that in academics by asking what issues are preventing our students from coming to the table to learn and not fixing them all at once, but just reflecting to them that we are aware and that we're working on it. And the most important part of open pedagogy is really to treat students as contributors rather than consumers. So reading is important, absorbing is important, thinking is important, but we also believe in open pedagogy that if you are reading and absorbing and thinking, that you have something valuable to offer about that content. So what's the way that that student would most like to share, um, not just in your class, but also when thinking about their future trajectory, their career, their academic life, um, their, their passions. Um, so helping students find those pathways to contribute is really what open pedagogy is all about. Um, at the end of this, and maybe Martha will actually drop it into the chat, um, we are going to give you a handout that has um, these uh, pieces of information and some other links as well, but some good places to start. The Open Pedagogy Notebook has examples from many different disciplines about people who are doing what they think of as open pedagogy informed teaching. So whether that's just one assignment that they've tried or a whole course that they've sort of refigured around open, um, you, can, you can check that out. Uh, we also have a, a LibGuide at Plymouth State and the LibGuide is made by our librarians. It really helps you quite a bit with OER and lowering the cost of learning materials in your classes. And let's say you thought today was really exciting, but my God, it was just way too fast. And I wish I could have an actual webinar on this. Um, another link on that handout is a one hour webinar that um, my friend Rajiv and I did for the open education. I don't know, for some group, <laughs> I actually can't remember which one now, um, but it's a more comprehensive hour long view of open pedagogy and, and how it works. Um, we have two minutes left, and with that, um, I will tell you that the whole video will be posted on the link that Martha just shared in the chat, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to take one before I let you out at exactly 12.15. Anybody have a question? No question, but you already inspired me to change something I'm going to do in my four o'clock class today. So seriously, I hope that's on the recording. Did you all hear that? She, she's already making a change. <laughs> Thank you, Lourdes. And thanks uh, to all of you for coming. And we will be back here at noon tomorrow for the next 15 and 15. I'll stick around if you have any questions. Um, but other than that, we'll see you later. Bye.